right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another 30 minute Intel session. This time it's all about Linode, but still a little bit linked to uh, performance. What I will share you today is how I used Linode to set up a distributed scale maze. Now, why should I set up distributed scale mates? Here is the result. This was my original architecture on the left hand side. You see uh, quite a high time to first byte for certain countries. And on the right hand side, you basically see what happened after the fix. So today is all about sharing how I got there, the techniques I used on Linode, the tools I used on Linode to basically get there and here and there also um, yeah, make some design choices. So let's first, before we dive into the cool stuff, let's actually first look at the original stuff. And like many of our customers, I, I'm, I was already running in the cloud. And in this case, you pick a specific data center. So my data center was Frankfurt for many, many years and the rest of the world basically I ignored. So all traffic would basically go to Frankfurt. Now, if we zoom in a little bit more onto the setup, of course, uh, on um, so my traffic is global, so from, they come from everywhere. I, of course, have the Akamai platform in front of me, so for security, performance, caching, edge logic, image optimization. So ideally, everything was served from cache. If it was not coming from cache because it was a cache miss or for dynamic content, I would basically go back to Germany. Um, what is the stack I'm using here is I basically have a dedicated machine, dedicated CPU, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM, which is quite heavy. Uh, so I, have, I use compute, the CPU and the, the RAM basically. I have attached some volumes. So that's, um, that is block storage. Block storage is mainly used, for example, for your database files, for the log files, for the temporary files actually used on the operating system. Next to block storage, I also have object storage, and that's the S3 compliant uh, storage system. And that's where I store my images. Uh, so here we're talking about two to five terabytes of images, which are basically very, very static data. Of course, I set up uh, backups and I'm using uh, MariaDB, which is, a, which is a sister of MySQL open source, open source database. So at the edge, Akamai, the cloud, Linode, my software stack is old school PHP, uh, Engine X as a day, as a web server, Solar, which is a the search engine, which uses a lot, a lot of memory and a lot of lot of CPU, and in order to make that fast, and then MariaDB as the database. So the 32 gigabytes, a big portion of it is consumed by the Solar um, uh, search engine. So that's basically it. Um, now, if you're looking at Scalemates, I have global audience. I have 900,000 pages, 16 translations. So if you multiply 900,000 times 16, you're roughly at 14 million pages, uh, pages. Around 50K changes a month to the database. And there are like 3 million price comparisons. So there is like a lot, a lot of dynamic content, changing content. And although it's not a small site, it's also not the biggest site. So I have a lot of long tail content. So that was a problem. And actually let's zoom in. Here you're looking at the actual problem. Here you see the waiting time. So that's the server time, the thinking time of the server for my product detail pages. And my product detail pages is what people come to uh, for to my website. And currently I can't cache it. Why? Too long tail content, too much changes. And I try with all the best practices in place, there are a few problems. If you're looking close in Germany, it's like green, UK, not that far from Germany, uh, all green, all the countries which are close to my origin are quite fast. However, as soon as you're far, farther away from the origin, you have some problems. United States, not that bad, but it's getting uh, bad. Australia, a real problem. Japan is also on the, on the problem side. So how to fix that? And I tried everything on Akamai and all the best practices are in place, persistent connections, all the, all the things. But for these countries, I still have a problem. So next thing is how to fix that. 
And if you can't bring the users closer to your origin, what can you do? You can basically bring the origin closer to your users. And this is basically what I did. So I looked at the map of, um, of, um, of Linode and I decided to set up in, uh, in this example, three locations. Basically one is, um, one is the US, one is Australia and one in Japan. And what you basically see here is that I set up a replica. So this is still the primary, all edits, all changes to the database are done in Germany in the primary, but I create like a copy, which is kept in sync almost in real time in the US, in Australia, in Japan. Now, the first thing you, a few things to note here is that in Germany, I need 32 gigabytes in US, Australia, and Japan. I went for a smaller machine. And the reason is simple. I decided that for my replicas, I didn't want to copy the solar search engine and have like copies of those in three different instances. Why? Because it just takes, it consumes too much energy, too much power. So the idea was to for only for certain requests, if the user does a, um, does a, a search, they would still go to Frankfurt. If they then click on the product detail page, the idea would be to get uh, data from the local copy here. So you can see it's a slimmed down machine. Here I set up high availability. Why? This is my primary. If this one goes down, I really have a problem. The reason I decided at, at this stage not to set up um, duplication in these instances, because the idea was if Australia would be go down for whatever reason, ideally they would go to Japan or to the US or to the to Germany as the as the as a failover. Could I add high availability? Yes, but then you duplicate the costs. Uh, so that's that's a trade-off between, that's always a trade-off between performance, between availability, scalability, and, uh, and cost. So that's the basic idea. Now, as you can see here, one, two, three machines, you don't want to install those manually. So a new element in uh, the setup is Terraform. So Linode fully supports Terraform, and what it basically does, it allows you to configure your infrastructure in a config file. So this is basically the instance for um, the latest instance I created in the US. So you add some data, uh, some things hard coded, some things uh, like the type of the server that is that is a variable. So I can reuse that. So I have such a resource for every single um, for every single replica in the world. So that's one thing. The other thing that's for installing the server now then you have an empty server and an empty server is a bit stupid because you want your application to run there. So what you're seeing here is another way to automate, um, another way to automate Linode. Linode has the notion of stack scripts. And what is a stack script? It basically tells Linode, like when I create a new server, do all these actions. And without going into too much detail, it basically says like, hey dear server, new fresh in server, install engine X and start the service and change here the ownership of the directory. Next, install PHP and do some things. And I did the same thing for many of the other components on that page. But basically Stackscript is an easy way to automate certain things using bash scripts. It's not more or less than that. All fine. If I, after playing around a bit, I clicked on the um, Terraform plan and next Terraform apply that will basically instruct um, instruct Linode to create the infrastructure and this is beautiful infrastructure you hit the button within 30 seconds could be 40 could be 20 doesn't matter within 30 seconds it was basically complete next step install the uh, uh, oops next step is basically install the software with the stack script download nginx install it download the database uh, set up some directories create some user accounts very simple done in 20 seconds next thing is now we have a distributed server somewhere in the globe but they still need to talk to the to the mothership basically to the to the master in germany so in for that we basically need to set up accounts, open up the firewall, uh, share some keys, um, upload the certificates from uh, for scalemates.com from the from the origin server to the different different things. All that pretty easy to do. Last step is now we have a fully working 
server but no data yet. And that's the last step. Unfortunately, in my case, that takes around one hour and a half to copy all the data I need. So that's the data, creating the database backup, moving the backup backup, that's three gigabytes of data from one location to the other across the globe. Next, re uh, re uh, re uh, resetting the, restoring the backup, uh, moving all the files over. So that takes some time. I'm pretty sure I can win some time here, but main thing is it's not because your first steps are easy. If a customer has a lot of data, uh, you, we should be a little bit careful and humble about, oh yeah, Linode is fast and with Terraform you can automate a lot of stuff and everything is lightning fast. It's true, but the moment you start talking about copying data, then you have potentially a problem. What do we have now? A replica in three different locations, which each time when a database change is done in Frankfurt, it automatically gets updated. So I, I did some tests here that, that, for, that perfectly works. The next thing is how to send traffic to those replicas. And in order to get started, I basically started simple. I went into property manager and I decided the first thing I need to do is I only want to send traffic to those replicas in case it's a product detail page. So if it's a search or a login or something special, then I don't want to go to the replica. So initially I only go to the replicas for certain page groups. So that's basically the spot match. And because it's read only, I only go to the origin, uh, to these replicas in case the user is not logged in. So currently my logged in users, they still go to Frankfurt, no matter where they are in the world, but 80% of my users is not logged in and they should basically get um, a data from the replica. So that's first thing. Next thing is I looked at the map and I decided as a quick proof of concept, let's look at Sydney because I didn't know like, will it work? Will the, the new server crash after 10 minutes? There are like a lot of, lot of doubts. So I basically said, you know what, before making it too complex, let's in property manager decide if on top of that, the user comes from Australia or New Zealand, then change the origin and go to Sydney. That was basically it. And the result was quite nice. Here you see a similar graph. The moment I went live, everything, I basically the performance drastically Im improves on all percentiles, which is, which is good. However, that's only five, that was only 5% of my traffic. So in order to speed things up more, the next step was like, oh, maybe let's try Tokyo. I made some changes to my scripts. Um, let's try Tokyo. And here I went again, the lazy route. I basically decide which countries are close to Tokyo. And then, of course, Japan, Hong Kong, China, Korea, Taiwan, etc., etc., etc. And that's fine. But then you are like, what about Singapore, Indonesia? Should I send them to Tokyo or should I send them to Sydney? Then it becomes like a little bit, you're like a little bit uncertain. Huh? If it's somebody from Japan, sending it to Japan makes sense. Uh, but if you're like here in, in the middle, that's a bit more challenging. But just to test that, that will, and to keep things simple, I went this route. The moment I decided to also enable the United States, it was a bit more complex because there are like a lot of countries here. And my main message here is don't do this in PM. The first two steps was like good to play around, but um, here it gets, yeah, there are just a too many countries. And at a certain point in time, I decided, you know what? I actually want an additional data center in Fremont and I want one in Atlanta because a lot of the internet connections go via Atlanta. So that's the reason why I also picked Atlanta. And then you could in theory do that um, manually in PM, but don't go that route. You don't want to say like, oh, if US and state California, then go to Fremont. Uh, you don't want to do uh, that. This was basically just to get started, to um, to get get things rolling as quickly as possible, because for the same reason I could have detected that a, the application would not work, or I would have seen that um, certain things would would basically break, and then I would have had to had to fix that first. So the idea of the property manager was just to have like a quick POC, just quickly validate if everything works for a few countries where I really know that there should be a big impact and that it should work. 
and then it was like gradually adding things. And the moment, the moment I went to the US, my property manager approach no longer worked. Um, so what was the next step? We have an easy solution called global traffic management and global traffic management. You can, it's a DNS based solution. Uh, it's very easy to set up. It's, you can also automate it via Terraform. And basically the idea is that I no longer do that manual geo load balancing property manager because that's too complex and you're like unsure when it uh, um, like what about countries which are a little bit in between and gtm basically fixes that for you so in my property manager i just have like one origin dns entry saying like hey send this to the data center which is closest and um property my uh, the edge will then basically send it and uh, resolve the dns and send it to the right location either us australia japan and then for example people from singapore they might go to australia or they might go to japan that's then something which is decided at the edge so that makes things a lot simpler um good news is here you see the data center definition of gtm akamai in uh terraform without going into your details, but you basically give it a nickname, the city, you use the, you give the latitude and longitude that is used by GTM to decide how close the data center is. And I basically copied that a few times. And here you see the, when I automated that part, that everything is done in an automated way. So you do that once, I can add an additional data center, just hit basically the enter button and a sixth one would be created and everything then would be switching to the different locations in an automated way, which is good. And here you see the end result. So Terraform not only works in the node, it also works on, uh, on Akamai. So that was automatically generated. Before turning on that button, I did want to check like, hey, is it actually working as expected? I like to use this DNS checker where you can add the DNS entry. So perf satellite scale mates .net. That's basically the, the GTM entry, which is used uh, by property manager to decide to which origin to go. And here you can see that based on the location that they will basically get some different IP addresses as expected. So that's one thing. The only thing I next had to do was basically go into property manager and then add this entry. If today I would decide to also include, for example, Singapore as a data center, I would basically add that to Terraform, spin up the server in Singapore, add an additional location in the data center, uh, add an additional data center in uh, GTM. And as soon as that's activated, the next time a user in India or in Singapore or close to Singapore would hit property manager and they would resolve the DNS entry they would be sent basically to uh, Singapore closer by. So without the benefit of GTM is without making changes to property, you can basically add additional instances, etc. So that's one thing. Um, here you see, this is then a nice graph from property from uh, the um, GTM. You see the different traffics sent from a DNS perspective. So there you can basically see if everything is working fine. Um, what I also did is I added an additional dimension in Ampels, which I think is very powerful, which tells me from which data center the um, the um, the request basically uh, came. So I can a validate if there are, for example, certain performance issues because right? everything is I know in the primary data center everything is tuned since ten years. These are quite new servers, so there might be some performance degradations over time because of memory leaks, for example, or I might see less traffic to Sydney than expected that might that might indicate in some issues. So this is this gives me real time visibility into performance as well as real time visibility into load balancing. Um, this is what this one. This was my manual attempt in the US. I know I said never do it but I still tried it just to see if there would be a big impact. So I decided like, hey, do we actually need the intelligence of GTM? So I spent a lot of time implementing some load balancing rules in Property Manager just to find an excuse not to have implement GTM yet. 
And so here you see the traffic on the Atlanta data center with my manual setup. And here when once GTM was enabled. So basically my assumptions for certain, for, uh, that certain uh, states or certain countries should go to Atlanta was basically wrong. And the moment GTM uh, was enabled, you actually saw a performance improvement as well because the best location and the best data center was picked in a fully automated way. So basically GTM, great. On the initial diagram, you saw that I had like three different data centers. In the meantime, I added um, San Francisco and I will likely in the next days do another experiment for Singapore. Basically the same story, everything automated, wait a lot of time for the data to, uh, to be copied over and then have the GTM entry uh, be added. Now, this was actually not my final um, design because application load balancer should be, was the, in the end, the end goal. And the reason is simple. Why application load balancer? Because application load balancer allows you that in case Australia goes down to instantly reroute the traffic to somewhere else. So that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. I could have some, I don't really need that yet, but in the, in the near future, I want to extend it. And I could have like things like session stickiness that like once I'm sent to Australia, I don't want to be sent, for example, to Japan if I'm like somewhere in the middle. So that's also something application load balancer has. Why did I still go for the GTM step? Because application load balancer today has a small problem. That is that you need to define your origin also in property manager. So basically what it means is if I want to add an additional replica, I need to end update application load balancer and I need to update an origin via property manager. While that is possible and you can also automate that today, the whole property manager thing is not automated because I like to still to do their stuff manually. So that's the reason why I didn't go for application load balancer and went for uh, GTM. But yeah, that's still on the to-do list to actually go for go for application load balancer. That's, are there any additional questions? I can see the chat. So I saw Alec. Um, Random asked, good question. How fast was database replication? That was actually one of the reasons why I, why I initially also wanted to test. And when I made a change manually and I immediately hit refresh on the, I have, I had like, yeah, I also have some feature toggles where I can decide myself to go to the new one. I can, I basically almost don't see any delay, meaning there is likely a delay, but we're looking at less than one second of uh, delay. The moment the priority makes a change and then it's basically visible in the, in the replica. Um, so. From that perspective, I would say it's almost uh, instant, uh, Brandon. Uh, one of the things I always want, want uh, um, because that comes to the next question, how to keep the database synchronized? So uh, that's an excellent question. So both MySQL as MariaDB have out of the box replication capabilities. So you set up a master or a primary, and then you can set up a new uh, SQL server or MariaDB instance, and you mark that as mm. the satellite or the replica you basically need to register this one here you need to have a user to replicate and then from that moment on everything is just synced in a fully automated uh, in a fully automated uh, way the only complex thing is the initial setup because you need to you need to start like the synchronization at the at an exact point uh, there is like a position um, that's a bit complex where I played around, but once you know that, it's basically super, super easy. So it's basically out of the box uh, database replication provided by many uh, database uh, systems. Um, when are you moving all this to macro meta? That's a good question for what? Um, in theory, yes, macro meta and all these other cool things are great, but they involve rewriting your application. And one thing I didn't want to do was basic, and that's great if you want to have to redesign or build a new service, then you can look at those things. But in theory here, the point I wanted to make is even if you have an old school legacy PHP application running since 10 years, 
that you can still embrace the cloud to make things better and easier and um, and and faster. And if you if you think it a little bit uh, longer term, with Linode adding more data centers in the near future. If, for example, once they add one in Brazil, one of the first things I will do is I will set up a data set, an additional replica in Brazil. I might set up an additional replica, for example, in um, in Italy um, for covering Italy and then the rest of Africa, for example. And then, yeah, I think that's the point with the cloud. Even if you're not looking at the newest shiny things without redesigning or completely building stuff from scratch, you can still embrace the value and the ease of use of the cloud. Um, are you measuring your replicas for CPU and MEM usage? In theory, I should, um, the, uh, because I use Datadog for my primary. In theory, I should also implement Datadog here, but yeah, Datadog costs per server. And um, yeah, it's it's still a hobby project. So yeah, I, I need to figure out if I basically use, uh, because Linode comes out of the box with some, um, with some uh, tracking mechanisms, so I will I will first play around with that if that's good enough. Otherwise, it, I would also set up um, and it's a real customer using, for example, Datadog or another tool to track their performance. They would um, they would basically uh, set up instances in uh, in here.